one of the last ideas I'd like to play with is what happens when you outsource reciprocity? So when your obligations for social exchange are shifted onto a third party. And I want to start off with a very intriguing example. Think of reality television. Your obligation to socially exchange with the people on television is completely one-sided. They're letting you into their life, they're showing aspects of uh, their beliefs, their practices, and, and it's interesting for us. But we have no, as the viewer, have no, no obligation to reciprocate di directly with them. However, their sponsors, the advertisements, the television station are getting something from us, and that is our attention, and they're getting an opportunity to market products our way. So um, this is an interesting example of when we outsource reciprocity, there is something else going on. There's, there's a different kind of exchange going on. And are we completely in control of that exchange? As soon as reciprocity is um, offloaded onto a third party, how much are we in control of that uh, reciprocity? How much are we in control of what we give in return? I'll give you another example. Um, you may have a Facebook account. You might be on the Facebook, the Facebook. <laughs> so weird when people put an article in front of Facebook. I just did it myself. Uh, now, people who use Facebook don't pay for it. Uh, and, but we are putting a lot of our own personal information on Facebook. And now if we don't have to pay for it, where is the reciprocity happening? What are we giving? that is balancing out the equation between Facebook, the organization, the company, and us. And obviously it's that, it's that access to data. It's all that access to our personal information that is really useful to companies that want to learn how to market their products better. Companies that might want our personal information for personal gain. P companies that can then target their advertising at particular Facebook users. Um, so obviously this skews the direct exchange between people and offloads that onto a third party. And I'll give you another example. Um, supermarket loyalty cards. This is, this is mine here, my supermarket loyalty card uh, for Woolworths, a chain of stores, or it's, it's also called Countdown in, in New Zealand. Now, when I use my card, I can get a dollar off or 50 cents off certain products at the supermarket. But what am I giving the supermarket in exchange? If we accept the notion that, of Marcel Mouse's notion that no gift is free, that there is an ob obligation to give, an obligation to receive, and an obligation to reciprocate, what am I reciprocating when I use my, my, my loyalty card and get these discounts off goods? Well, obviously it's personal information again. The supermarket gains information about the combination of goods that I am buying, how often I go and buy, uh, where I purchase my goods. Um, I also get money off petrol. So I might go to a supermarket in one suburb, but then go to a petrol station in another suburb. So they're getting information not just about what I'm buying and in what combination I'm buying these goods and how much I'm buying, but also where I'm buying it and um, how much petrol I'm consuming in comparison to how, much, how many goods I'm buying at the supermarket. So obviously by outsourcing reciprocity, there's something that we have to think about. Pierre Bourdieu, the, the French uh, sociologist, showed that apparent generosity might conceal the misuse of power. And I think outsourcing reciprocity is a very interesting example of this. Now I want to finish with a very simple example, well it's not a simple example, but I'm going to finish with it anyway, of um, the importance of paying attention to reciprocity during ethnographic fieldwork. Uh, this is my martial arts teacher in West Java. Uh, his name is Pa'aji Uho Holidin. And West Java is very interesting because they are one culture where, um, where musicians accompany the martial arts. And here it is, um, Pa Oseng, who is my drum teacher in West Java. Now, the drummers in, in West Javanese martial arts have to accompany the movement of the performers very accurately. Every movement, every punch, every kick has a corresponding sound. You know, it's like doo, 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 duck, 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 bah! And it's a really enthralling uh, performance to watch. But what brought about that particular combination of music and martial arts? It, it's, it kind of 
um, anti-intuitive or counterintuitive to <laughs> putting the wrong prefix, counterintuitive to put music and martial arts together. But there's a very interesting history to this, and uh, Indonesia was obviously colonized by the Dutch, not obviously, but it was colonized by the Dutch, and the Dutch had a policy of indirect rule that turned sultans, kings, regents, nobles, and nobles and other aristocrats into civil ser servants. So these, these nobles retained all the titles and outward signs of ceremonial hierarchy, but in practice they were no better than civil servants who received a government salary and were no longer able to extract corvée and products from the land or from their peasants. But they, they wanted to retain their original style of living. So what was a way for them to retain their standard of living and, and to re retain their, their lavish lifestyles on these meagre salaries? Um, and, and one way that they did this was by hiring thugs to go out into the villages and terrorise the villages and, and, and scare them into giving over um, you know, produce from their farms or uh, you know, aspects of their wealth. Now, of course, hiring thugs isn't the best way of making friends. So another way that these nobles, nobles um, would exert their power and demonstrate their, their, their authority and, and the, the fact that people should continue to give them goods was by hiring performance arts and, and sending them over to villages and having these lavish ceremonies where people got to watch a performance. So, for example, they would hire Wayangolic puppet performances or gamelan music performances, but a really interesting performance that was served the dual purpose of letting people know that you had the potential to be mean and to, to hire thugs, but also entertaining them at the same time was to hire martial artists. Now, how do you turn martial art into a performance art? Well, you add music to it. So, the sultans, nobles and kings who were no more than civil servants by this time then turned to the martial artists, hired them to, to do performances and paid the musicians to accompany them. Now, the best musicians who were able to really animate the performances were the ones who got the most jobs. So in the beginning, these sultans had actually put music and martial arts together in this performance space and then created a space for musicians to try and become better at what they do to accompany what the, the performance artists were doing. Over time, the performance artists, the, the martial artists, ended up paying the musicians themselves because they, was, we were, they were started doing performances at circumcision ceremonies, at wedding ceremonies, at harvest feasts. Um, and, and when the martial artists paid money to the musicians, obviously the best musicians would be hired if they had enough money. And also, if they, if, so sometimes these performers would go up on stage and they would give money just before going on stage to be accompanied. Now, if they didn't give enough money or if they didn't give enough cigarettes or a, a big enough gift, the musicians could actually make the performance look really bad, really sloppy, by not accompanying it very well. So the martial artists were then interested in keeping this good relationship with the musicians to make their performance look better. So these patterns of reciprocity, these social patterns of reciprocity, actually impacted on the relationship between music and movement in these martial arts performances. So paying attention to reciprocity is really useful to look at how social practices change, how social relationships change, to look at politics, to look at uh, economics, to look at emotions, to look at law, law matters of law, to look at legal matters. Um, and, and hopefully by unpacking the essay on the gift, uh, it's inspired you to think more about reciprocity in your work, in your personal life, uh, and in, uh, in the world in general.